Hello. Thank you very much for allowing me uh, into your life for the next few minutes. What I'm hoping to do over the next uh, few minutes and certainly over the next three topics is to try and first put type 2 diabetes into a perspective, literally tell you a story, and then subsequently go through the process of how you would potentially treat someone you saw with diabetes. And finally, how do you transition such individuals uh, to insulin? So I think that's the sort of overall agenda of what I'm going to do. For the first part, the objectives of this particular section is to outline the major organ systems involved in the pathophysiology of insulin and type 2 diabetes. Also discuss the interrelationships of these organs, so how do they work to develop diabetes, and then target the medications that we have available. Remember, we have a number of medications available. How do you target them? What is that target, and how we can make them work in a synergistic manner? so that we can treat the underlying pathophysiology. Now, no token diabetes would be legal without this particular slide. I think this slide basically points out to you that in the upper graph, you see the, in, the consistent rise, first in postprandial sugars and then fasting sugars. How do they occur? Well, to a large extent, insulin resistance is present very early on. In an effort to overcome this insulin resistance, the beta cell basically starts to produce more insulin. At a point where the beta cell can no longer produce any more insulin, you start to see the decline in the insulin level, and that's when first the postprandial and then the fasting sugar starts to rise. And obviously, this loss of ability of the beta cell to produce is a continuum and therefore it progresses so that if people live long enough and we don't change the therapies we have, beta cell loss is inexorable and they will end up on insulin. So I think that's the sort of quick uh, summary of what I'm going to say. But the first question is, what is insulin resistance? And what are the concepts of insulin resistance that we need to sort of keep in mind? Is it truly genetic or is it in fact something that changes the gene? It's interesting that it is obviously aggravated by the obesity and it is obvi uh, 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 clearly exacerbated by the lack of exercise. The idea is that is this really going to be an exhaustion of beta cells or are the beta cells, either because they overwork or because of some genetic defect, going to die prematurely? And I think that's what we're going to sort of touch on. If you look at the genes, it's fascinating to note that there is only one gene for insulin resistance, the IRS1 gene. There are 28 genes at the last checkup for beta cell function. So clearly, the insulin resistance gene is a very protected gene. We haven't found significant gene variations. What have we found? What we found is that, in fact, we've always bought into the theory of the thrifty genotype. That is, uh, modern humans evolved by selecting genes that promote insulin resistance in a nutritionally deprived environment. Thus, the thrifty gene confers a survival advantage. But in today's world, where most of us are overfed, it tends to become a disease process. We need to think about it as a thrifty phenotype. That is, that the fetus in the uterus makes changes in anticipation of what it thinks it's going to meet in the outside world. How it makes that prediction is multifactorial. One is the intrauterine nutrition and environment, absolutely no question. But what's most interesting is it also is dependent on the mother's nutritional env uh, environment when she was born, and you go back a number of generations so that a fetus born to a mother today reflects not only the uterine environment of today, but the uterine environment of the past few generations. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because environments change rapidly. The process of environmental change has never been as rapid as it has been recently. So we have to find patients, people have to realize that you can have periods of good nutrition, but you should be available for the periods of poor nutrition. And that's how the body or the fetus tends to decide. 
So the plasticity that you see is in one genotype, this one insulin resistance gene, is able to change its gene expression because of its, of its attempt to prognosticate what environment it's getting. So the alterations in fetal nutrition will result in fetal adaptive changes leading to altered tissue. So for example, if the baby feels, the fetus feels, it's going to come out in a nutritionally deprived environment, it wants to make smaller tissues, wants to make them more efficient doesn't want to have a lot of fat cells because it doesn't want to necessarily pick on them. So under those circumstances, the baby makes itself smaller. And that's why we know that a small for gestational uh, age infant tends to have a higher lifetime risk for diabetes. These changes are not directly genetic. They're epigenetic. And they are run by the fact that you these modifications, those epigenetic modifications, this methylation of the DNA of this particular gene, allows for optimal use of nutrient supply, blood flow redistribution in favor of vital organs, changes in the production of fetal and placental hormones contributing to fetal growth, and decreased basal metabolic rate and decreased nutrient delivery. So you see, you start very early dealing with the process of how you're going to deal with the outside environment. And this is just an example of methylation. And you see that when there's no methylation, you get increased gene expression and active gene. But as you start to methylate, and depending on where you methylate, you can get a completely different gene expression. And I think that's what I'm trying to show in this slide. So if we move away to a little bit to say, what are the target issues for insulin? Well, the target tissues, the major ones, are muscle, liver, and fat. Those are the major targets of insulin. Minor ones, the beta cell. Even though the beta cell produces insulin, it is still a target organ for utilization of fuel because it's got to use fuel to make the insulin. The heart, we know that the heart is intrinsically going to have to develop metabolic changes depending on whether you're environmentally starved, environmentally uh, nutritionally fulfilled, mainly because you can't stop the heart because you don't have enough food and all the, otherwise all of the you feel utilizing organs. When you look at the differential amount of insulin resistance, it turns out that fat is the most sensitive of all these hormones. And that makes sense. Think about it. You want to use fat as your storage, but you want to be able to release fat as a, as a fuel supply the moment you're deprived. So that in effect, when you look at insulin action on fat, to inhibit 50% lipolysis. Remember, insulin is the most powerful depositor of fat. So when insulin levels fall, or ins functional insulin falls, you start to have lipolysis. You get a release of free fatty acids. To get 50% release of free lipolysis, you need only eight microunits of insulin. On the other hand, in the liver, the liver collects glucose, and it's supposed to release glucose when there's starvation. To allow for 50% hepatic glucose output, you need 40 microunits of insulin. So the liver is more resistant than uh, fat, even in the normal physiology. And then muscle. Muscle is the biggest acceptor of glucose. 70% of glucose is going to be disposed of in muscle. So therefore, the muscle cannot do this without thought for the rest of the organism, so it is the most resistant. It takes 200 microunits to allow for 50% glucose disposal in muscle. And when you look at insulin action at the liver, what you see here is it takes very little insulin to stop lipolysis. That's the reason why we have hyperosmolar non-ketotic states. For a hyperosmolar non-ketotic state to occur, you've got to have some insulin. That stops ketogenesis. Thereby, you can then continue to produce an inadequate amount, in, inappropriate amounts of glucose, but you don't run ketoacidotic. The next thing it does is, is it inhibits gluconeogenesis. Then it inhibits glycogenolysis and inhibits glucogenesis. And when all of these are inhibited, you've got inhibition of hepatic glucose output. Notice, muscle glucose disposal doesn't occur until your insulin levels are way over the level that you need to be able to block the liver. And that just tells you the differential resistance. So when you look at insulin resistance in the liver, as you see in the red line, type two, uh, patients with type 2 diabetes release a lot more glucose at the same level of insulin that controls do. And in the muscle, it's the exact opposite. They dispose of less glucose for the level of insulin as compared to normals. And when you look at what happens in the muscle, the, mu or the cell, the basically the cell looks at two fuel lines. 
the plasma glucose fuel line on the, on the left hand side and the plasma fatty acid fuel line on the right hand side. If you've got enough plasma fatty acids, you will take up the plasma fatty acids, you will inhibit the absorption of glucose. That's normal. When we take a fat man like me who's basically insulin resistant, what happens? My insulin levels do fall, but they don't fall as much. My glucose levels don't fall as much. So my cell looks at glucose, sees the free fatty acids, picks both of them up. Problem? The moment you pick up both, if you can't oxidize the fat, it then recongeals to form intercellular triglyceride. That's the basis of hepatic steatosis, that's the basis of cardiac steatosis, and that's the basis of why, one of the reasons why the beta cell fails, because the beta cell gets increased amounts of triglyceride inside it. It turns on an intercellular nitric oxide, which then is beta cell cytal. So in effect, this alternative fuel used in the presence of insulin and glucose tends to become a problem. And so when you look at how insulin works, yes, it works for the PI3 kinase, but notice at the liver, it has causes decreases in gluconeogenesis. At the heart and the vascular endothelium, insulin acts like a dilator. And in adipose tissue, skeletal muscle, it allows for glucose uptake. Now, when you look at regional fat metabolism, you see something that's fascinating. And this is the reason why visceral fat is so bad, because if vis visceral fat is going to send free fatty acids directly into the portal circulation. It's going to go directly into the liver. And now you've got a liver that's going to have to deal with a much higher level of fat. And that makes it much more insulin resistant as opposed to subcutaneous tissue fat, which goes into this general circulation, goes into muscle, but does not necessarily affect the liver as quickly or as directly. So when you look at the association between insulin resistance and visceral fat, you find that insulin resistance increases as the visceral fat increases. And when you look at what happens when you've got excess uh, free fatty acid mobilized, you get decreased glucose utilization by the muscle because the muscle says, well, if I've got this alternative fuel in excess, I'll use that. And the liver says, well, I'm seeing too much fat. Obviously, there's not enough glucose around. I've got to start producing more glucose. And you see increased gluconeogenesis. And both of these work towards causing hyperglycemia. So in this particular experiment, what you see here is a hyperinsulinemic clamp, which is we gave a large amount of insulin. You clamp the glucose, and you find that, in fact, glucose transport starts to be uh, significantly affected. Or rather, it is not affected as much. But when you start to infuse lipid, notice the significant drop in glucose transport. Put it another way, this is an experiment you do all the time in the intensive care unit. You start someone on uh, parental uh, nutrition, you give them glucose, they don't have much of an effect on the insulin requirements. You give them interlipid, and immediately the glucose uptake falls, uh, their glucose synthesis falls, glycolysis falls, glucose oxidation falls. Notice non-oxidative glycolysis is not affected, and hepatic glucose output is turned on. This is what happens when you get free fatty acids going into the liver. So, I think it's also important to realize there are tremendous, remarkable similarities between the adipocyte and the macrophage. So when you've got macrophages going into adipocytes within the visceral fat and turning those adipocytes on, you're going to get a lot of inflammatory responses. These inflammatory byproducts go to the liver, and in the liver, they will enhance uh, insulin uh, resistance. So now you've got three lines how you increase hepatic insulin resistance. Free fatty acids going into the liver through diacylglycerol affecting AKT3, causing increased gluconeogenesis. I promise you, I don't know any more biochemistry than that. Uh, free fatty acids also turn on ceramides, which do the same thing. And then the inflammatory cytokines working through a different set of pathways again blocks AKT3, and you stop gluconeogenesis. So you've got a turn on of insulin resistance in the liver just by the presence of all these parameters. And so you see here how the fact that you've got all of these factors happening increases the potential for insulin resistance. I wish I had time to go through this in greater detail, but I think it's important to understand that the excess intake of nutrients overloads the free fatty acids in the hyperglycemic conditions, increases reactive oxygen species production, reduces mitochondrial function, and therefore leads to an exacerbation of the whole process of worsening of insulin resistance. Okay? So 
You've got primary modulators that affect uh, the tissues, which are hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia, leptin, cytokines. Secondary modulators, the autoimmunity, and some, uh, obviously the drugs that we have. And those effects work on the beta cell as well in terms of how the beta cell functions. So the consequences of hyperglycemia on beta cell function can be either acute or chronic. In the acute situation, hyperglycemia is associated with an increase in inflammatory factors, which then causes an increase in differentiation, function, proliferation, and, ap and decreased apoptosis of the beta cell. But chronic hyperglycemia does the exact opposite. It causes a decrease in differentiation, a decrease in function, a decrease in proliferation, and an increase in apoptosis. So acute hyperglycemia has diametrically opposite reactions to chronic hyperglycemia. Now, one of the other things, we've talked about all these tissues. We've talked about the beta cell. We've talked about why the beta cell can be affected. The question is, how do you regulate how you deal with nutrition? And we know that insulin is produced when you eat food. But we know insulin is produced within two minutes of starting to eat. There is no way we've absorbed any glucose. So what is the signal? It turns out that if GLP-1, which is a gut hormone, is highest in the ileum, where food doesn't get to until two hours, it is also present in the tongue. And in the tongue, it basically acts as a neurotransmitter, turns on the neurons to the brain to tell the brain there's food coming down the pike. The brain then turns us peristalsis in the gut. The gut says, oh, well, if peristalsis is occurring, food is coming down the pike. It starts to produce the GLP-1 hormone, which then signals the production of insulin. So it's actually a very intricate process. And this is one of the reasons why there's been this recent data showing that people who are, take diet drinks don't necessarily lose weight and sometimes gain weight because the GLP-1 is turned on by the taste of sweetness, not the sugar. And so therefore, if you fool the G uh, taste receptors to believe there's sweetness, which means sugar, you will turn on insulin production, turn on appetite, even though you're taking a diet drink. And I think it's sort of important to sort of keep that perspective. GLP-1 has a very significant paracrine effect. So GLP-1 not only works to turn on the beta cell and turn off the alpha cell, but it also turns on the cells of the intestine to produce SGLT-1. SGLT-1 is a glucose transporter that enhances glucose absorption from the gut. So GLP-1 not only produces insulin, but it makes sure you're going to produce a lot more, uh, you're going to take up a lot more glucose. However, if you're talking about beta cells, and we're talking about beta cells driving the progression of disease, then we're going to know something about beta cells. We know beta cells are made at the sixth week of gestation. Until the twelfth week, they have nothing to do except propagate. From the twelfth week, they have to do two jobs. They have to deal with the nutrition coming in from mother because placenta is in place, and they've got to propagate. And if you change the load, if you ask the beta cell to work harder at looking at the nutrients coming in, then in fact the beta cells don't have enough mass. So you can the amount of beta cells you're born with starts to get decreased in the uterine environment. We also know that beta cells die. We know that beta cells over the age of 40, the rate of degeneration exceeds the rate of regeneration by 1% or 1.5% per year. That's why all of us will have diabetes at the age of 125. But don't worry, you'll be in renal failure by 120 and probably in pulmonary failure by 115, so it makes no difference. However, if your beta cells are dying more than that, in people with diabetes, they're known that apoptosis or degeneration occurs at 5% per year greater than regeneration. So you can hit your diabetes threshold much more quickly. And so you find here that, in fact, you can activate or you can re, re, uh, remodulate this process by using GLP-1s. And GLP-1s have a tremendous effect on the effect of apoptosis as well as potential regeneration. There's no question that given someone who has absolutely normal beta cells, it doesn't matter how much they eat and how obese they are, they can indeed produce insulin. It's when their ability to produce insulin goes away that you get into trouble. These are experimental rats, basically overfed on uh, fat. Notice how the beta cells have grown. They've become large, plump, plump, very good beta cells. The problem is, if that does not happen, if for some reason your beta cell cannot accommodate, then you get diabetes. And so here, in lean and obese subjects, autopsy study shows that obese people, in fact, without diabetes, have a larger number of beta cell volume and mass. 
On the other hand, people with diabetes, notice here that as you become impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes, you have less beta cells. So it's the beta cell mass that in the end determines when you can get diabetes. It is not necessarily the insulin resistance. And how do beta cells fail? Well, we know the genetic potential, but now glucolipotoxicity, the mechanism I talked about earlier, where the beta cells series both glucose and free fatty acids, the accumulation of this uh, free fatty acids within the beta cells, the accumulation of ceramides, the, the, the occurrence of mitochondrial dysfunction within the beta cell is going to predispose to premature beta cell uh, destruction and death. We know how the insulin works. We know this process because it's important to think about incretins as an incre intrinsic part of the pathophysiology. We know that in people with, uh, who don't have diabetes, they're able to regulate their glucose very, very closely in the top panel. Why? Because they're able to produce all this insulin, but most importantly, they are immediately able to stop glucagon production. What that means is the insulin going up allows you to dispose of glucose. Glucagon going down means your liver no longer is producing glucose. In person with diabetes, notice the glucose excursion is higher, but it's because they don't produce as much insulin, but their glucagon doesn't go down, so that there is an enhanced delivery of uh, hepatic glucose output into the circulation. And when you look at this incretin effect in the top panel, this is an interesting experiment. On the left-hand side, you took people who didn't have diabetes, in the, uh, in the blue, they got an oral glucose load. People measured the glycemic excursion very accurately. They measured the uh, corresponding insulin. They then gave the same glucose excursion using an intravenous glucose load, and notice the insulin effect was markedly less. When you did that in people with diabetes, this effect was markedly attenuated, indicating that there was a problem with the production of GLP-1. And while you, when people have looked at GLP-1s, there might be some differences between healthy impaired glucose tolerance and type 2 diabetes. But this is the more telling experiment. In individuals who, where you infuse GLP-1, in the left panel, 0.5 picomoles per kilogram per minute, giving you an ambient level of uh, 46, 41 picomoles per liter. Notice the normal in yellow produced a good amount of insulin. The abnormal, the person with diabetes in blue, did not produce insulin. To be able to get the person with diabetes to produce insulin, you had to be able to achieve a GLP level of 126, about three times what's, what would be normal. And so when you look at this and you think about the DPP-4s, what do DPP-4s do? They, by stopping the destruction of endogenous GLP-1, they allow for a threefold increase. So we can see why DPP-1s have given us the ability to modulate insulin and sugars. This is an interesting experiment. Take individuals with type 2 diabetes, give them saline in the, in the yellow line. The sugar falls a little bit over four hours. They do nothing with insulin, and they continue to have uh, tonic glucagon production. You infuse GLP-1. Notice the sugar falls. The insulin goes up, but starts coming down. Glucagon goes down, starts coming up. The most important part of this slide is the last hour. As the sugar got close to normal, around five millimoles, the insulin stopped being produced, the glucagon started being produced. What happened? No hypoglycemia, because the GLP-1 doesn't cause the release of insulin, it facilitates it. The director for causing the release of insulin and, uh, and stopping the release of glucagon is glucose. So as your glucose gets down to normal, you start producing insulin in spite of the continued infusion. Now, what else do we know about this? And these are cultured human islets. Notice, in a control environment on the left-hand side, from day one to day three to day five, these islets die. Yet, when you expose them to GLP-1 in an in vitro circulation, human islets, they live. So there are data, not direct human data in live individuals, but data that suggests that when you use beta, in cretins, you are potentially protecting the beta cells from dying. And you see this in your glosses when your uh, drug rep comes in, he says, look at my drug, I got to maintain hemoglobin A1C over five years at a fixed rate. It was no drift. Why? Because the beta cells are not dying. And that's what we need to do. It is passé to look at glucose control only. What we really need to look at is, yes, glucose control, but can we stop 
the progression of diabetes. And that's what I think the focus of our next few years of work is. And when you look at GLP-1s and you look at different levels of glucose, different levels of fat, fatty acids, and at the addition of a GLP-1 or non-addition of GLP-1, and you look at the rate of apoptosis measured by tunnel, you find that the addition of GLP-1, either at low glucose or high glucose, low fat or high fat, continuously protects the beta cells. So when you think about the management of type 2 diabetes, we look at this drug parameters, and you see here, yes, Metformin and TZDs help to improve the insulin resistance. Metformin more at the liver, less at the muscle. TZDs more at the muscle, less at the liver. We've got the ability to secrete insulin. The old ones, which was uh, sulfonylureas, TZDs protect beta cells. Now we've got the GLP-1s and the DPP-4s. DP, uh, TZDs also inhibit lipolysis. We know, why th th we know that that does the job. We've got SGLT2s that allow the regulation of glucose coming from the renal part. And we've got a, a dopamine agonists that change the way the brain looks at nutrition. So we've got the ability to hit every one of the major organ systems that play a role in the process of the development of diabetes. So in conclusion, insulin resistance is a major contributor to the development of type 2 diabetes. It has some genetic associations. But environmentally associated epigenetic me mechanisms are what contribute most to the development of persistence of insulin resistance. The, insulin, uh, the intracellular mechanisms of insulin resistance are ubiquitous to all cells, but and they contribute to the subsequent development of beta cell failure and apoptosis. But to actually get diabetes, to get an abnormal sugar, you must have beta cell dysfunction. And this loss of beta cells is what allows us to develop diabetes and then it progresses in the inexorable course we've got. So as we go forward, we, can, we go on not only to control glucose, but stop this apoptotic process. And we might very well end up with attenuating and changing the natural history of diabetes. I think I'll stop there and maybe we'll go on to uh, the next uh, in a few minutes.